So let's start with this. Um, down here in Texas, the legislature meets every other year for 140 days. So I think it might be helpful if you could just let us know, how does the legislature work in Maine? So we meet um, for a two-year session. There's the first regular session, which meets from uh, January to roughly June. Um, typically. And then we have the second uh, special session, which is when we're supposed to consider the supplemental budget and emergency bills. And that is supposed to run January through April. So we come in a little bit more, but we're still a citizen's less legislature with typically the second half of the year uh, free. And for you specifically, you have a really cool job title. You are the assistant Senate, Senate majority leader. Uh, yeah. Down down here in Texas, we don't we don't have a Senate Majority Leader or an Assistant Senate Majority Leader because I think that all falls under the role of the Lieutenant Governor. So yeah. just uh, tell us what a day in the life is like for the Assistant Senate Majority Leader. Absolutely, it's one of the most fun and uh, fun jobs I've ever had, and it's a great honor. Um, I am, you know, the nickname for the position that I have is the Whip. But for me, I see it more as almost being, you know, the family therapist or the family camp counselor for our members. So, you know, I'm responsible for knowing and checking in how many members we'll have for attendance, working with our incredible staff to make sure that everyone knows where they're supposed to go. Um, but the thing that I really love is I get to talk to members about their votes and see if they need more information. And it's a really incredible process. I mean, it's hard as a legislator on any policy to decide your own vote, but getting to hear where other people are coming from is really incredible. And then as part of our leadership team in the Senate, um, uh, Eloise Vitelli is our majority leader. So she and I get to run the Senate majority office. And then Troy Jackson is our Senate president. And so the three of us check in every day on a legislative session, we do calendar review, we you know talk about what's gonna be going on and sort of delegate to make sure that we keep moving the Senate forward and sort of like a full team on a boat. Mm -hmm. And it looks like one of your big missions recently was uh, the paid family and medical leave bill, which uh, just recently passed, maybe this week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so how gratifying was it to see that bill pass? Absolutely over the moon. This is something, so I first got elected when I was 25, and this is something I've been working on since then, um, and been working on very intensely with my co-sponsor, uh, Representative Kristen Cloutier, who's actually the assistant House Majority Leader. So we have the same positions in the two different chambers. She and I have been working on it very intensely for the last three years. And uh, it passed the House and Senate, and then it actually was placed in the budget and had the full startup funding. And the governor signed it into law on Tuesday. And I've been a total roller coaster of emotions. It's probably, you know, it, it is the most gratifying thing I've ever worked on. It took a team, it was truly from all over the state, you know, advocates, we went on tour, we talked to businesses, we talked to proponents and opponents, and it was, you know, that rare opportunity where you really have a compromise bill and really, you know, we had to walk that middle line to make sure that you minded the policy to make sure it was financially solvent and also met the demographics of Maine. And I wonder, uh, just, just from my perspective down in Texas, um, you would think a bill like that in a blue state, you know, it might be easier to pass, but it looks like you kind of had, had an uphill battle passing it. You said it took three years. Um, I read articles from a few months ago where it looked like the bill was dead almost. Um, so why was it such a, an uphill battle to, to get it passed? So a bill of the size, I always like to joke that my signature piece of legislation, I built something that you need a long time to explain. I mean, the bill itself was almost 30 pages. But, um, you know, it's a new large program. It is an absolute change. We have unpaid FML in Maine. We were actually one of the first places in the nation. We passed our law in 1985. The federal FML law, FMLA law didn't happen until 1993. But, you know, this is something that does create a new payroll contribution. So you have to make sure that you're meeting people's financial needs and that it fits within our demographics. And also change is hard of this type of size. And we had to make sure that not only did it work for employees, but also employers. So one of the things I'm the most proud of is we had thousands of conversations and this was coming out of a commission that spent two years modeling every potential financial uh, projection for this program. And so it was really, you know, meeting to see what people's biggest fears were and, you know, concerns about absenteeism, how does it work? you know, who qualifies, how they qualify, how much they have to pay in, and being the oldest state in the nation meant that we had to really make sure that the program really worked from birth to the end. We sort of said it was the bookmarks is what's covered in this program. And I think any any policy of this size, it doesn't matter whether you're in a blue state, a red state, or a purple state, you know, it, it takes a lot of work. 
especially when it creates, you know, a new portion of government or a new contract, you have to make sure that everyone's voices are heard and that you're really sort of steering the ship to make sure that everyone feels like they've been a part of the process and truly contributes. And my last one on this is that um, after the bill passed, uh, the White House uh, released a press release uh, from the press secretary that actually quoted the president as mentioning your name specifically. So how cool was that? I I still keep pinching myself. I, I have been working on this bill for so long. I mean, I came to it after losing an extended family member to cancer and caring for her and then hoping that, you know, this is something we could pass, you know, to be able to cover, you know, birth of a child. I've also, you know, was hit by a car. So I saw what it was like to be out of work with no pay. And I, I sort of joke, I've grown up with this bill because, you know, starting, you know, in my early twenties on it. And not only, you know, was it complete elation to have this bill signed into law, but then to have the White House recognize the work that we've done. And I think Maine has really led the nation on this of how to do something really collaborative. We didn't rush to anything. I know a lot of people like quick change, but, you know, for something like this, it's good to be deliberative and make sure you're checking all the boxes. And yeah, it was just the uh, cherry on top to have the White House recognize our work. And to turn the table a little bit from a bill that you did get passed to a mm -hmm. bill that you didn't get passed, I saw that you had proposed uh, that high school students have to take a high school uh, financial literacy class yep. before they move on, before they graduate. That That's such an interesting bill to me just because, I, I mean, I'll use myself uh, as an example. Um, you know, I've checked a few good boxes over the years, you know, got my degree, got my master's degree. You know, I have a cool hobby where I get to interview state senators all the time, but I am almost always broke, almost always. And I feel like uh, maybe that kind of class really could help me because I have almost none of those financial skills. Um, so what what was your thinking uh, behind proposing that bill? Uh, then second, do you think uh, you'll try to revive it, uh, revive it in a future session? Yeah, it's interesting because this is another bill I've been working on since I first got elected. Uh my colleague, Senator Matt Pouliot, who's a Republican, he and I actually introduced, he was the sponsor at that point when we first got elected, a bill to require financial literacy. Um, but it got placed within the social studies curriculum and didn't really thrive the way we were anticipating and hoping. And a lot of teachers who work on this are saying that the curriculum mandate is not strong enough for them to be able to offer this. For me, I started working on it personally because I'll never forget, um, I was a studio art major. And when I think I was like 11, maybe, maybe 10, I informed my parents that I wanted to be an artist. And my dad has a wonderful sense of sarcasm. And he started laughing and said, yeah, you're going to need a trust fund for that. I being a complete, you know, being like, okay, well, I guess I need a trust fund. This is not something, you know, I come from a very working class family. This is not in my future. So my parents asked me what I wanted for my birthday. I asked them for a trust fund. And to their credit and to the credit of a local credit union, they actually brought me to this credit union and one of the branch managers sat me down for a little financial literacy class, helped me open my first savings account and my own checking account. And I went back and forth and kept meeting like this little group and like had these little, she helped me make a budget. And I was just a young kid and it was absolutely pivotal to how I run my life and I realized it was something that not a lot of my friends had. It wasn't talked about in high school. And I can remember being 17, trying to decide to apply to college and being faced with these massive monumental loans. And at that point, you're not entirely sure how this is gonna have ramifications. And you know, I'm, I'm in the millennial generation and we're absolutely not to be crass, but we're getting screwed. We're the first generation since um, recorded economic history to not accumulate more wealth than our parents. We're actually doing worse. And I really think a lot of that is the cost of post-secondary education, but also the fact that we're not given the financial tools to be able to plan our own future. You're actually encouraged to take on unsustainable amounts of debt. So that's how I got passionate about it. And I'm definitely gonna keep fighting for it. The bill's actually been carried over. So it's not dead yet, in the words of one of my favorite movies, um, mm -hmm. The Princess Bride. <laughs> uh, so we're really hoping they're gonna study it over the summer and see you know, what the curriculum landscape looks like. So I'm going to be pushing really hard in the second session. Uh, we had tons and tons of outreach on it. I'm still getting calls and emails from people who managed to find the article or heard about it from someone else. And they're like, how do I make this become a law? So. I'm hopeful for the second session. Mm -hmm.
So, so here in Texas, uh, probably our most pressing issue right now is uh, climate change. I mean, just the heat waves we've been having are insane. So I wonder um, in Maine right now, what, what do you think are some of the most pressing issues? I'm sure y'all deal with climate change too, but in a slightly different way. It's a very, very dire issue. I mean, it is over our entire climate, our entire globe. But for us, how climate change is impacting us, it's actually warming the Gulf of Maine. We're one of the fastest warming bodies of water in the world. And for us, that's a large part of all of our livelihoods. It's threatening our lobster industry. I grew up here in Brunswick where um, the body of water I grew up on is called McCoy Bay. It's one of the most important eelgrass estuaries in the state. And I've watched it um, get completely infested with an invasive green crab that is destroying our clam flats. And that's all coming from climate change. So we're seeing um, fish uh, fisheries go further out to sea or move up into the Maritimes in Canada. And additionally, you know, this year we've had strange weather. I feel like everyone else has, we've been sort of spared from the heat wave you all are having, but we've had nothing but cold, damp rain, which is really unusual for Maine. So we're doing a lot of work on not only trying to do everything in our power to reverse climate change as much as one little state can, because we see the ramifications every single day in both our economy and looking out the window, but we're also trying to make sure that we have resiliency built in. So the governor has a 10 year climate plan. She actually, I think it was the UN climate conference that she actually went and got to speak about our plan. Um, and you know, we're working on our power infrastructure. How do we make sure that we have you know, reasonable investments in renewable resources while also making sure that things are cost effective for Mainers. Um, we're looking at EV charging stations. I actually passed a bill, which, you know, little people, some people are a little confused by at first, uh, to give rebates to um, electric bicycles to encourage folks who are able to commute to consider using that instead of a gas-powered car. Um, so it's it's a major part, I think, for all legislatures, but for us. You know, the other aspect we're seeing it really hard is in our ski industry. The amount of skiable days is declining. And we're also seeing more and more mountains having to make snow. And so it's impacting from the, you know, very north of our state to the very south. One of the things that happens in our legislature is um, some of the more important work gets distracted by the culture wars. And I mean, for instance, we probably had more bills this year in the legislature that were focused on limiting the rights of transgender individuals than we had about, you know, the heat wave or climate change, the electric grid. I wonder if uh, being in a blue state, you have to battle less of those culture war issues or if they still exist up there in Maine. I would say less, but they still exist. We still had many of the same bills that you all saw in Texas. I like to call it sort of the greatest hits of the culture wars. And it's really frustrating because you know, I've now been in this over a decade, and what doesn't make the headlines is the majority of us, regardless of party, get along. The majority of our bills are passed bipartisan. I'd say about 85% of them get through unanimously. But when we're really focusing on people's private lives instead of on things like the economy and job creation, it, it's not pretty. It's not good for anyone. And it really divides us. And no matter what one's personal beliefs are, the culture wars, you know, really is about pitting us versus them, which I think is the most, goes against the American dream in the most incredibly disturbing ways. I mean, the, our entire country was not only founded on freedom of religion, but the ability to dream of a better future for yourself and your family. And so many of these bills that we're seeing across the country run completely counter to that. It's saying that we wanna tell people who and what they can be and they can only look a certain way. And as we start to wrap this up, I wanted to move into some lighter territory. Um, for people in Texas that might one day travel to Maine, if you had any recommendations you could offer to us, but I will add the caveat that I went with my grandparents to Maine. Mm -hmm. And so please don't suggest any lighthouses because I've, I've seen enough lighthouses. <laughs> there are some lovely light lighthouses, but yeah, I would say, honestly, I'm from the coast, so I'm a little bit biased. I grew up on the coast. Um, we have, if you took the uh, coastline of Maine and stretched it out, I can't remember how many times it could go back and forth between the moon. We have that much coastline. 
So I'd really recommend that people, you know, check out Portland, which has been named several times by different groups, one of the foodiest cities in the nation. We've got some incredible restaurants. In my life outside the legislature, I'm a brewer, so I'm a little biased in saying if you like beer and you're coming from Texas, you got to check out, check out the Maine Brewers Guild. We have an amazing map showing all the breweries across the state, and it's actually a prize if you go to all of them. Um, and we're known internationally for our New England IPAs and a lot of our other beer styles. So I'd highly recommend people come up and down the coast. And then we also have the most amazing um, trail systems. What I love, you know, where I live in Brunswick, I can be in the mountains in just an hour and hiking up to an absolutely exemplary peak. Or I can be going to a lake to jump into, or I can be swimming in the ocean all within a matter of an hour, which I think is very unusual for a lot of, you know, topography and a lot of geography in our um, in our nation. But there's so much there's so much to do. I mean, people come have been coming to Maine to vacation since the beginning of time. I feel like, and so no matter what your your favorite pastime is, we we've, we've got it. My final question would be, you know, you've been in the state legislature since your 20s. If, uh, if you had any advice for young people that would want to follow in your footsteps and get involved, get into elected office, what would that advice be? Trust your gut. You have something to offer. I think the biggest thing when I ran for office, it's not what I planned to do. I was actually um, working as a photographer and as a reporter, um, and that's how I thought I was going to sort of serve. I grew up in a family that volunteered in every single election, and I felt my role to play was being part of the media. And um Unfortunately, graduating in 2009 was not a great time for jobs uh, in, in the print industry, but um, the seat that I ran for in the house, um, there was a vacancy and people started asking me to run. And I remember distinctly being like, wait, how? I'm 25. I thought you had to be a lawyer with two and a half kids and a white picket fence. And I'll never forget my best friend, Eliza, was like, no. You have so much to offer. Like our generation has so much on the line. And so I was a replacement candidate. She and several other people, you know, talked me into it. I had two and a half months to run for office. It was totally wild. And it was the best decision of my life. And I think it's especially critical for young people to run for office because our future is on the line, whether it's things like financial literacy or climate change or just our ability to afford a house we need a really diverse set of voices and that's you know we need diversity on all aspects and you know especially on age and gender and background because the more our lawmakers look like our nation I think the more our laws look out for everyone not just a select few so my biggest piece of advice is do it and with that that's Maine State State Senator Maddie Daughtry Senator Daughtry thank you so much for joining the program thank you so much for having me and I hope you all come to Maine